Thank you very much for the kind introduction and invitation. So it has been very nice to be here. And so you have a great department. Uh, I was really enjoying talking with uh, people I had never met before. And so you also have a great student, and uh, I had the pleasure to know one of them, which is Jin, and who is a student of uh, Sean Wen. And so today I will uh, talk about the tensor randomization group and uh, application in quantum simulation that we have been working with uh, Philip Price, who is an experimentalist at Heidelberg, Judah and Yoki, who is my student, Sam is a uh, also my student working on the machine learning and uh, Joel Git is at uh, Rensselaer and Li Ping Yang at uh, Chongqing University and so uh, I will uh, start with some general introduction about uh, the, the kind of physics you can do with uh, lattices and then discuss some of the simplest uh, lattice models. So this, uh, uh, this is just a general introduction, but I will discuss very simple models. And then uh, discuss the general idea of the renormalization group that was invented in the mid 60s. And uh, then uh, I will present some result about a new method that is called the tensor renormalization group method, which is exact unlike other exact method. Uh, and then uh, describe some calculation of quantities in a very simple model, which is the O2 model with a chemical potential that has an interesting phase diagram, including the famous costellitz tullis uh, phase. And so we will calculate the entanglement entropy with this method and then uh, try to entice experimentalists to use new method to calculate what is called a central charge. And then I will conclude with a possible uh, application of the renormalization group idea in the machine learning. So my uh, interest, so I started as a particle physicist, so my main interests are in lattice gauge theory with some uh, serious application like semi-leptonic decays of B meson and also exploration of new models, possible new models for, uh, say, uh, new strong dynamics. These are really complicated uh, problem. I will focus on things that are much simpler. And so the, my broader interests are the application of the renormalization group to uh, phase transition, quantum computing, and more recently, uh, machine learning. So uh, lattices are just periodic structure you are probably very familiar with. And so you. And uh, as a general remark, feel free to interrupt at uh, any time. Uh, so I'm, uh, I want to be uh, have the basic <laughs> part of the message well understood. So don't hesitate to ask questions at uh, any time. So uh, there are different physics community who deal with uh, lattices. I can. Uh, I could start with the smallest lattice spacing. <laughs> so for instance, people who do lattice QCD use it as an ultraviolet regulator. This is not a physical entity. This is something that you want to be as small as possible. So typically uh, a small fraction of a Fermi. So you don't see too much of the lattice artifact. Now if you uh, go to the scale of uh, one Einstein, then you have a real uh, lattice that occur uh, naturally in the real world. And so these are uh, a big playground for studying condensed matter and studying the crystallography. And more recently, uh, people have started reconstructing lattices artificially by taking counter propagating a laser and trapping 
polarizable uh, molecule or atoms. And so in that case, the lattice spacing is of the order of a micron. However, despite this uh, disparity in scales, when the physical scale or the co what we call the correlation length are large compared to the lattice spacing, the underlying lattice becomes unimportant and uh, people can talk together. And so starting uh, as early as 2010, uh, Shan Wen Tsai and myself and a few other people started to organize conference where we could put together these three communities at Aspen or the INT or KITPT. And uh, so it was uh, for me uh, very interesting to learn about what other people were doing with lattices and uh, so I learned about the application of the realization group in problem that are conventionally in condensed matter and similable with uh, optical lattices from uh, Shan Wen and uh, collaborators. And uh, just to give you uh, another uh, idea about what can be done with uh, lattices, this is a study made, I mean, led by my student, uh, Dapping Du. Uh, so he uh, was leading this analysis of uh, a weak decay, so the uh, B meson going into a pi and a lepton and a neutrino. And so this allows you to measure with a uh, good accuracy this uh, VUB uh, in the Kobayashi Maskawa uh, matrix. And so this is a very difficult analysis that I will not describe, but uh, the important thing for high energy physicists is to get rid of the lattice spacing. And so you will, if you open that paper, <coughs> you will see that there are calculation of form factors made with lattices that goes from 1 point, sorry, 0.12 Fermi to 0 0.045 Fermi. And so what we want to do is to extrapolate to zero. And so the, the lattice for us is a, uh, just uh, ultraviolet regulator, uh, but at the end we want to take the limit of the continuum. Now, uh, it typically prepares you well for other career, and so Dapping is now uh, working with uh, uh, big data in a firm in San Francisco, but in uh, the meantime, he, I was very pleased to see that he was able to use his knowledge of the ON model to uh, deal with the anonymization of a medical document. So this is, uh, it illustrates that uh, people who think about lattice can uh, go in uh, many uh, directions. So now let me uh, describe some uh, models and so most uh, of in most of the example I will give are two dim dimensional. So this is a square lattice. And so just to specify my terminology, uh, the point of the lattice, I call them side. The line between the points, I call them links. Some other people call it bounds. And then uh, the little square that you make with two links in the uh, orthogonal direction are called plaquette following uh, the French. So when Ken Wilson invented uh, lattice gauge theory, he gave a talk at uh, Saclay, and he was trying to find a name for this. And uh, Claude Zixon uh, suggested plaquette. Plaque is a little square. A plaque is a square, and then plaquette is a little square in French, and that was uh, adopted. <laughs> so it, this came from uh, uh, Ken Wilson work on the lattice gauge theory. And so you can generalize uh, hypercubic lattice very easily uh, in an algebraic way uh, by just uh, having sides that are integers and uh, integer with direction, integers with a couple of direction gives you the plaquette. So it's very easy uh, for simple lattices to generalize in any dimension. And uh, 
so models that are particularly interested as interesting for lattice gauge theories are spin models because they uh, have fields that are compact. So they, the simplest example is the Ising model. So you have a spin that is up or down at every side. But then if the vector is two-dimensional, then you have an angle. It's called the O2 model. And so the O2 model in two dimension has Kosterlitz two less transition. And you can generalize easily for uh, n-dimensional models. These are called the ON models. And so these, in this case, the field is forced to stay on a sphere that is n minus 1 dimensional. And they are, uh, you can think of them as a Goldstone uh, excitation. So they are appear in nonlinear sigma models. And so uh, these are simple models that lattice gauge theories like to study. So the main goal is to calculate the partition function and then so the integrate over this field with uh, Boltzmann weight, or uh, you can think of it as an uh, action. In, so if you take the lattice to you interpret the lattice as uh, d spatial dimension one Euclidean time, then uh, you can think of it as a path integral in the Feynman uh, sense. And then you calculate, you, you uh, do the path integral if you want, and you in insert observable to get average. So that's the uh, what you want to calculate. Uh, just uh, now, a little more complicated model is the abelian X model. And uh, so this is a model that we have suggested to try to quantum uh, simulate. And so basically, you have a part where the scalar field is coupled to the uh, here just a phase. And you have a plaquette interaction that is like the F mu nu. And then, uh, so you can allow some uh, X mode when the lambda is a finite. When you take lambda going to infinity, the norm of the, the, the field is uh, 1. And you have the O2 model with coupled to gauge field. And again, you can calculate the partition function. So these are relatively uh, simple models. And uh, this, uh, so when you do. When you develop new methods, you want to uh, look at them uh, as the first thing to, to do. Now, a uh, very generic uh, method that it can be used uh, for all of this model is the using important sampling. And so this is generically referred to as uh, Monte Carlo. So for instance, uh, if you consider the Ising model on the 512 by 512 lattice, you have an astronomically large number of configuration. And so astronomically is not the right word, because even if you had a very fast computer, it would take many uh, times the age of the universe to enumerate this configuration. But however, you can get a very good idea about the physics and uh, about the observable by using importance sampling. And uh, so uh, if graduate students have never done this, this is something that you can do in uh, not a very long amount of time. So you take a spin at random. So you take the a square lattice. You take a spin at random. And you ask, uh, so you, 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 you first you, you put a random configuration. Right? But then you take a spin at random, and you ask, what happens if I flip that spin? And so it, then you have to calculate the part of the energy that depends on the, uh, the so the, the spin has four neighbor. So you have to multiply the spin by the sum of its four neighbor. And then if flipping the spin reduces the energy, then you flip. And if 
uh, flipping the spin increase the energy, you flip it, but with a certain probability, which is the ratio of the Boltzmann weight, and that will give you naturally a uh, Boltzmann distributed uh, set of configuration, and you repeat until the average becomes stable. And so I would encourage graduate students who have never done this to try to do it, and you can do this in the f uh, not a very long time. This is the main uh, code in Python that you need to uh, do this. And uh, so let me show you a few pictures, the typical thing that you will get. So this is uh, so this the, the the Ising model that I uh, uh, just described. Uh, so you have the sum of the neighboring uh, spin on the square lattice, and so the spin uh, just up or down. Eh? So this is a, a 512 by 512 lattice, and the inverse temperature is 0.2, so it is a kind of a hot uh, configuration. And as you lower the temperature, so as you increase beta, you start to see more correlation in the, uh, say, black or white island. And uh, suddenly, things start to change uh, more dramatically. And so the critical temperature of this model, so this model has a second order phase transition around beta equal 0 0.44. And so when you get on the other side, you start seeing uh, big uh, islands with uh, uh, interesting <laughs> edges. And uh, so this is 0.6. And then I repeated the experiment, uh, putting a little magnetic field. And uh, now the response to the magnetic field will be stronger when the temperature gets lower. So I, uh, now this is at beta equal 0 0.3, 0 0.4, 0 0.5 and 0.6, and so you see that you can generate an interesting texture by uh, doing this uh, experiment. So I would encourage every graduate student who doesn't know what I'm talking about to spend a few hours doing this kind of thing in Python. It's uh, much more fun than any computer game that you can think about. <laughs> <laughs> any questions? Uh, Sometimes I tend to forget to say essential things, and I like to have a student who say, oh, did you, did you tell me this? And ah, no, I forgot. So if anything I forgot to say, or like, OK. So uh, now, so when uh, Ken Wilson was a graduate student, he visited uh, Caltech, and uh, he went to Murray Gelman's office, and he said, do you, do you know what I should work on for my PhD? And he wrote the Ising model, and he said, there is a solution in uh, two dimension, and find a solution in three dimension. You look like a clever fellow. Uh, so, and, uh, so Ken Wilson didn't solve the three-dimensional model, but he invented a method that uh, allow you to understand what happened to the three-dimensional model, the two-dimensional model, and a gazillion of other models. And this method was the renormalization group. And so the, the basic observation is when you are near the transition, uh, all the scales become important. And so you need a tool that can uh, take into account all the scales in an iterated way. And so, uh, in short, the recipe uh, for the renormalization group method, and so I should, to be uh, fair, I should add that the idea of blocking was also introduced earlier by Leo Kadanov, and, uh, and again for the same purpose of understanding second order phase transition. So in the, uh, for instance, in the, in the, the 
liquid gas transition in water, you have a line of first order phase transition and the end at the uh, end point where uh, the higher derivative of the partition function become uh, singular and so this is called a second order phase transition. And at the second order phase transition you have large correlation and so they had to invent a method to uh, deal with this uh, by trying to reduce the complexity of the problem little by little. So the recipe is you replace the microscopic degrees of freedom by coarser one. And so that uh, is named like taking block spin or uh, cutting off at the idea of decimation. So integrate over selected uh, uh, spin or field. And then rescale the new variable in such a way that the new interaction, so you have a, like a new Hamiltonian and uh, in the formulation I will discuss it's a new tensor and they should be comparable to the original one. And so you have a transformation that maps an Hamiltonian into Hamiltonian and the uh, genius of Ken Wilson was to say this transformation has fixed point and this fixed point correspond to second order phase transition. And then when you have found that fixed point, you can try to linearize the transformation and separate uh, what is relevant. So when you iterate this transformation, you have direction that expand, these are called the relevant direction, and some that are irrelevant and that contract. And so that was a revolution that uh, uh, resulted in understanding the idea of universal uh, behavior, the fact that systems that look completely different could have transition that are characterized by the same type of uh, linear behavior or critical exponent. So that's uh, a very short uh, summary of what was done by Leo Kadanov and uh, Ken Wilson. And so this is an illustration of the, the, the blocking method. So this is just an 8 by 8 lattice. And then you group these uh, uh, lattice into blocks. So here of, with a four uh, spin. And you call the spin in this block, the, so the new spin. And then you can repeat. So you can take blocks that are twice larger and try to uh, write an, uh, an effective Hamiltonian for the, for the new spin. So that's a graphical illustration of the blocking idea. So the, the goal is to get uh, so a sequence of Hamiltonian that describes the physics uh, of blocks that are larger and larger and then look for the fixed point and do uh, linearize analysis. So it means that you make a small change near the fixed point and you look at the change after one uh, renormalization group transformation and you get a matrix that you can diagonalize and uh, you have to look at the large eigenvalues. And so they, the eigenvalues of these relevant direction gives you critical exponent and they are calculated with uh, now very high, well, <laughs> at least two or three digits in uh, two and three dimension. And so they uh, measure your ability to uh, do uh, calculations. So this is a schematic uh, representation of the flow of the parameter in the space of interaction. So you have a fixed point, you have the irrelevant uh, direction here, the, that contract, and the relevant direction that expand. To get to the fixed point, what you need to do is to, you take a line here and you fine tune until you get on the irrelevant direction and then it will evolve toward the fixed point and you, then you can do linear analysis uh, near, near the fixed point. Now, the success of the uh, 
film normalization group idea are enormous. The, in addition of uh, calculation of Kittel exponent, it had a big influence on the construction of the standard model. And uh, so the standard model gained uh, instant recognition the day Toft and Veltman proved that the Higgs mechanism was uh, giving renormalizable interaction for the Weinberg Salam Glashow model. And uh, now, in the Wilson language, non renormalizable interactions mean they are irrelevant at low energy, and so you can have a very predictive uh, theory uh, that has, has been very successful so far. Other accomplishments are understanding QCD, uh, so quantum chromodynamics, so the theory of strong interaction. So at short distance, it looks like it's a uh, free theory, and at large distance, it has a uh, very strong interaction that confines quarks uh, inside hadrons. And uh, so it was also very influential to calculate uh, matrix element in weak decays and understand the continuum limit in the lattice gauge theory, which is the, the uh, theory for QCD uh, that is defined non perturbatively. Now, the tensor renormalization group method was uh, div so now the idea of blocking and genera generating new Hamiltonian is very uh, difficult in practice. And so typically, people had to do a lot of approximation that were not controllable. And this problem is resolved in the tensor renormalization group method. It applies to a very large number of models. Uh, so all the spin model, principal chiral model, gauge theories. Uh, and it has been, it's free of sign problems. So you can deal with uh, theories that have a complex action, as we say. It has been tested with a worm sampling. Uh, we have done calculation of critical exponent. And one interesting uh, feature is that the Hamiltonian picture can be uh, obtained very easily, and so we can we have used this with Shan uh, Wen Tsai and other to design uh, uh, quantum simulators that I will discuss a little bit. Uh, I have personally not done fermions, but uh, people uh, in uh, Japan in a Japanese group have worked with the uh, Schwinger model. And so the basic uh, idea is that block spinning is a very complicated uh, process. And so if you, so I told you, you can do uh, a Monte Carlo for Ising in a few hours. But if you want to write a formula for the block spinning uh, of Ising, you will see that it gets rapidly out of control. So I do not recommend it as a leisurely exercise. However, uh, the TRG, so the tensor renormalization group, pro provides a simple way to do something that is exact. And so the basic uh, ingredient is what uh, we call character expansion. And so you can check uh, very easily that since the Ising spin uh, plus or minus 1, so this product is plus or minus 1, uh, you can expand this function in terms of two, uh, two different functions. One is the, the cosh, and one is the shin that multiply uh, sigma 1, sigma 2. And then you do that on every link of the lattice. You collect uh, the, the spin with, so, the, so you do that with every link, and then you sum over an index that is 0 or 1 on the link. And so I apologize. This is the main technical uh, slide, but it's something you can do easily. So you have an index that is 0 or 1, depending if you have a 1 or uh, this hyperbolic tangent. And then you can sum the spin exactly. And you get uh, at every 
side, you get a tensor that is factori factorizable. And so you, have, uh, you can use this to draw, to draw warm configuration, so you have a co current conservation. And uh, the final result is that your partition function can be written as a trace of a product of tensor. So that's a uh, very short way, an exact way to write the Ising model. OK. And so the tensor is just, so you have a side here, and it, it uh, connects to the four, four neighboring side. And the trace means that I sum over the index that is between the two links E. So this is an exact uh, form of the partition function. And now uh, the basic idea of the tensor renormalization group is that you can draw a little box here and enclose these four sides, and you can sum exactly over the uh, indices inside. And uh, your answer will depend on the value of the indices coming out of the box. And so at the end, you have a new tensor. And so you have exact formula for this. And uh, so you generate a new tensor. And your partition function is the product of a new tensor. And now by doing truncation, you can have a mapping between tensor with a certain rank. So the indices take only a certain number of uh, values into itself. And you can look for the fixed point. And so that's uh, uh, exact uh, realization of the blocking uh, program. Um, now, the truncation are not very well understood. Uh, so I tried first with two states, and I got very good exponent within uh, one one person. So you take just uh, so you start with uh, so you have Ising, you have a ones or hyperbolic tangent E, so you have four possibility, and you project over the largest two eigenvalues of a uh, like reduced transfer matrix. So for instance, you can attach this to this, and then you have a matrix, which is a 4 by 4 matrix. You project over the largest two eigenvalue, and so you can reproduce two state, and this works very well. But uh, when you add states, the accuracy <laughs> uh, gets less good. And uh, Leo Kadanov was also working on this at that time, and he found the, the same, he made the same observation. And so we need a better understanding of this uh, phenomenon, uh, or we can improve the truncation uh, method. And uh, unfortunately, he died uh, two years ago, and uh, so he we had discussed uh, this the possibility of understanding it on a more systematic way, and so I'm still uh, working on that. Now, another model is the O2 model. So instead of having up and down spins, you can have spins with a relative uh, angle that is the difference of the uh, on angles, so you have cosine uh, of the difference of the angle in the time direction and in the space direction. So this is called the O2 uh, sigma model. And uh, to make things interesting, we can put a chemical potential. And so this chemical potential is imaginary, and it makes the action imaginary. So. Uh, if you want to use the Monte Carlo method that I have discussed, it will not work because the, the e to the minus beta delta e will be complex and it, it uh, cannot be used as a probability. However, with the uh, tensor renormalization group method, you get something that is uh, 
Rio and the matrix that is used to project on the states is a positive matrix, and so you have no sign problems. So, uh, and you can also think of the, the representation in terms of character as a warm, so you can, uh, so you have a conserved current and you can follow this conserved current through, uh, if you want, imaginary time uh, slice and uh, you, so you can write sampling uh, algorithm for the, these worms and check with the blocking method and so we got a very good agreement between these two. Yep. So, uh, th so this is the the chemical potential. So now, when you do what I have explained with the Ising model, so I, I take the so the interactions are on the link, and so I will expand this exponential of the cosine on the link in terms of Bessel function. And then when you put this, you will get uh, e to the mu n. And so this, uh, uh, so when you have a Fourier expansion, the i with the i becomes real, and so you have a mu n, so it pushes the positive n up, and uh, it uh, reduces the negative n, so it breaks the charge conjugation. And so this is why I call this a, a chemical potential. And so in this formulation, everything is real. And uh, so what we can do is to, now if you, the eyes, the uh, Bessel function, so for instance, cr create a, a worm with quantum number one, you have I1, and I1 is like beta. And so you can, uh, have mu large enough so that it can compensate the smallness of beta, and then you have uh, the one particle number gets above the zero particle number. So that's why I call that a chemical potential. And it's, it's pretty close to what you would call in uh, uh, statistical mechanics. Yeah. Other questions? OK. So uh, yeah. So let me just, uh, so you can now calculate the partition function in terms of the transfer matrix. And let me just show the, so the transfer matrix is just, you take one time slice and then you pile them up. And you can block, you can use the block spin uh, method to calculate this. And then, uh, we can use that method to calculate the entanglement entropy. And so the entanglement entropy is the, so you take a density matrix and you trace over a part of it. So, so you take your space, you divide it in A and B, and you trace over B. And so with a transfer matrix, you just uh, trace it uh, here, but you keep it open in A. And so you can do it by blocking until you get one line here and one line here. And so that provides a very simple uh, representation of the reduced transfer uh, matrix in a subsystem. And uh, now experiments can actually measure the second order uh, entanglement entropy. And instead of T uh, this is not the von Neumann one, it's just the square of this uh, matrix. So if you had a pure density matrix, the trace of rho and rho square would both be one and this would be zero. But when it's not the case, you have the, what is called the second order Rényi entropy. And we calculated this uh, as a function of the chemical potential and uh, uh, J, which is the uh, tunneling uh, rate. And uh, so the, uh, you have a very interesting structure. So this is on a 16 
uh, side lattice, and you can see that the, when you increase the chemical potential, you have one particle, two particle, three, four, five, and until you get uh, 16. Yeah, and so this is the superfluid uh, phase of the model. And uh, so we, uh, so this is a conformal theory, and you know, I, I cannot give you a serious introduction to conformal field theory in two dimensions, but Cardi and the Calabres have shown that for uh, the second order Rainy entropy, A, the, the coefficient of the logarithm here, so the entanglement entropy scales at leading order like the logarithm of the size, and the coefficient is calculable using conformal field theory, and it's uh, the central charge divided by eight. And uh, then we have other corrections that are uh, justified also by uh, uh, conformal field theory. And now, uh, so at the beginning, uh, so I tried the von Neumann entropy, so it's the limit of the Rainy entropy when n goes to one with periodic boundary condition, and so it was very linear in, uh, with a log of the size, but when you go to the second order Rainy, then you start developing uh, oscillation, and then with open boundary condition, it's uh, even more uh, strong, and so this is what can, in principle, be measured by experiment if you can quantum simulate that model. And uh, so this is the O2 model, uh, the, the second order Rainy entropy for the O2 model, and the uh, black, sorry, the blue square are for a bose hubbert model that I will introduce uh, soon. And so they have uh, very similar entanglement entropy. And the estimate of A, so the coefficient in front of the log that is obtained by fitting uh, with this model goes uh, toward this uh, CFT value, which is uh, 0 0.125. Now, uh, so the continuum limit of the, the time can be obtained, and so that I don't have time to explain this in great detail for the O2 model, and you get what is called the Bose-Hubbert model that uh, has the cosine replaced by A dagger uh, AX, so that tunneling, and this is an on-site uh, interaction that no experimental atomic physicist can simulate. And so we can try to uh, reproduce the second order Rainy entropy and estimate the central charge by doing a measurement. So the uh, idea of measuring this uh, S2, so S2 is the uh, minus the logarithm of the trace of the uh, density matrix square, remarkably uh, has been accomplished in a lab two years ago by uh, the group of Marcus Greiner. And so the idea is, uh, so it's in a one space dimension. So you take two tubes, which are uh, optical lattices, you put them together, and then, uh, so you can so they, they, you leave them together, and you can uh, you can increase the tunneling rate, and they will get in the superfluid phase. And then they do something that is quite interesting. They uh, lower the potential. They keep the the quantum coherence, but they let the the atom tunnel from one copy to the other copy. And uh, this was a, <laughs> there was a way to measure this that was invented by Daly and uh, Zoller and Pischler in a recent PRL 
the, so the trace of rho square can be obtained by taking two copies of the density matrix and making a swap. And the swap was, uh, is obtained by uh, letting the atom tunnel by one half of a tunneling rate. So it's a quite remarkable uh, uh, result and quite remarkable that experimentalists can do such a thing. And so we. Ah, swap. So you, it uh, takes. Uh, so you have. A, uh, so, so this is a density matrix. So you have a, a, a ket E for A and a ket E for A two, and you uh, interchange them. And so when you take the trace, instead of tracing each independently, it first go from this to that, and then it close into itself, and you get rho square. It's not, more, it's a, it, it, there's no topology, but so instead of going like this, you go like, like this uh, to, so that's, that's what the swap does. And the swap can be performed by letting the uh, system tunnel between the two copies by one half of the tunneling rate. So that's, a, uh, you have to read this, this is a non-trivial result, so you have to to read this paper if you, <laughs> if you want to understand all the details. And so we made proposal for now our filling. So we can uh, instead, so that this was just by taking uh, one boson per site and going from the MOT uh, insulator to the superfluid by letting the tunneling rate increase. However, you can uh, do something that is uh, maybe more interesting, which is to fill uh, only one half of the site. And so in the recent preprints, we have uh, experimental proposal to do this. Uh, we, yeah, questions? We have studied the temperature effect, uh, which are uh, very important for the experiment. And also, uh, so Jin, who is a remarkable student, <laughs> has done calculation for a sudden expansion. So you take, uh, uh, for instance, a foresight optical lattice, and you put two uh, atoms in the left side, and you, you keep a wall uh, between that half and the other half, and then you have a sudden uh, opening. And this is a dynamical problem, and the gene has calculated the second order Rainy entropy as a function of time. And initially, uh, you know, you would expect that it would thermalize and uh, becoming stable uh, over time, but it still has an interesting structure. Uh, now, the Hilbert space is not enormous; it's only six sides, so. We are uh, looking at uh, larger lattices and uh, uh, see if uh, this would be interesting to, or possible to perform the experiment. Any, so I apologize for going so fast over the idea of quantum simulation. Are there any questions? Ah, because the, uh, so the von Neumann entropy is the limit where n goes to 1. But so in the experiment, you, so you, you do uh, rho square because you take two copies. And so the, these are the two copies. So you, you, you could measure the S3 by making three copies or S4, but you cannot take the limit uh, n going to 1. So. Uh, you can do it mathematically, but uh, the experimental uh, is just for n equal two or more. Then, okay, and so that comes from this very formula, <laughs> and you you can generalize for uh, many copies, but then you have to work a little harder on the phases. Then, <laughs> other questions? 
Okay, uh, now I am uh, going to spend a few minutes on uh, talking about apply applying the renormalization group idea to machine learning. And so this is something I have started very recently. Um, and so I'm not a real expert on this, but I am a learner. And so if you want to learn, I'm a good person to ask questions because I'm just uh, doing this. Uh, so machine learning is a rapidly expanding field of research and it's driven by money and so uh, it's, it's, it's good. <laughs> I mean, uh, it's, uh, if, you, if you want to do research in this field and if you are young, I, I think there are a lot of uh, possibilities. Uh, one of the questions that interests me is that many of these learning models have hidden layers and uh, the possibility that these hidden layers could be like block variable uh, I found quite fascinating. And another question is uh, can we try to use this hierarchical structure that we use to deal with a transition in lattice model to these learning uh, models. And also, uh, the, there are some practical considerations. For instance, you, you can reduce the uh, data according to what is relevant and irrelevant in a way that is very efficient in pattern recognition. And for instance, when you do Monte Carlo calculation, you have to save this enormous gauge configuration and could you save a lot of uh, time and space by uh, using some of the technique that are used in uh, machine learning. And uh, so <coughs> now hey, one, uh, the first time I gave uh, informal seminar, somebody say you have talked an hour about machine learning but you haven't told me what it is. So. Uh, I took the Stanford <coughs> course uh, on machine learning and so the definition they use is that it's the science of getting computers to act without being explicitly programmed to do a specific uh, task. And so the two main uh, alley are supervised learning, so when you know the answer and you can try to use a training set and then test with a testing set. Or there is unsupervised learning where you have to try to identify a structure in uh, 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 an ordered uh, data. So the one of the first uh, machine that <laughs> was designed to learn was a called the Perceptron, and I think it was built by Frank Rosenblatt. So they illuminate an area with uh, uh, like a digit, which is a six, and then behind this you have photo multiplier and uh, wires. <laughs> and now you can you tune the, the wires to have this apparatus to say, oh, it's a six. Now, uh, in these days, they, it was a very complicated operation, but uh, today you can use Python and write a 10 line code that does this. So uh, this is a digit, and so it's a five by five uh, uh, set of pixels. And so for each pixel, you have input variables. Then you have uh, whatever you want to be uh, as your function to be trained and at the other end you have output. So here we have to decide uh, what kind of digit it is. So there are 10 choice and so you can take 10 uh, output variable and what you want, so for instance when this is a 1, you want so you have 0, 1, 2, to n. So you want this to be very large and all the other one to be very small. So that's uh, 
that's your goal. And so surprisingly, a linear model is, uh, uh, so, well, it's not. Uh, so, so one very simple model that you can use is you take matrices that, uh, so you take a 10 by 25 matrix that you don't know, and then an activation function that is the, the sigmoid, so it's a function like this, I'll picture later. And so this, then you fix, you tune your W to get this type of uh, behavior. And so I was surprised that I get 91% correct result with this very simple model. And uh, now the, so th this is the, so when you develop a new method in field theory, you have to try the Ising model. Or when you develop a new method in uh, machine learning, you have to try the MNIST data. And so the MNIST data is just 60,000 handwritten digits. And you know what they are, even if they, sometimes they don't look like anything. So you know that this is a five, a zero, and so on. And so uh, you can now, so this is the way they look uh, microscopically. So these are grayscale pixels. And now if you average the 60,000 digits, this is what you get. <laughs> so this, you can see uh, some, <laughs> like a zeros and a five. What? The, you, so the, the 10 digits, the uh, average, with, they are basically 10, uh, sorry, they're uh, like about 6,000 uh, of each of the digits are average. E, this is the average of the 5,923 zero that are on the set, as you can see. It's a zero. And now, uh, so this is a, a little more sophisticated model where you have uh, hidden variables. So you, the, the Vs are the, uh, the pixels. These are trainable parameters. Sigma is the sigmoid. So I have a picture of the sigmoid. So it, when it's uh, much less than zero, it's almost zero. And when it's more than zero, it goes to one quickly. So it's a step, uh, kind of a smooth version of a step function. So the hidden variable, uh, so you have linear superposition of the uh, pixels. You put it in the sigmoid, and you have the hidden variables. And then you do it one more time. You have a second layer. Uh, so you put a new set of trainable parameter W, and you put it the sigmoid again, and you get your 10 uh, output parameters that you expect to be uh, very close to one when you have the right digit. So that's a simple model. And uh, then you have an error function. So you want your y to be uh, t, and t is one for the digit that you want and zero for the, the other. And so this is supervised learning. Then, so you have an error function, and you want to minimize the error, so you search with a gradient. And uh, so it works uh, very well. Uh, so you get 95 person with one uh, learning cycle, and then it saturates near 98 person. You can put more layers, and so uh, then it becomes an art to, to do this. And uh, uh, so now the failure. So I have two person of failure. So this is, uh, for instance, the testing sample 320 is this. So I believe it's a nine, and uh, <laughs> that's what the the testing sample tells me. The y function are 0.349, but they are a little bit higher for one. And so that's a failure of the, the model. So that two percent you fail, and so this is an example of, of a failure. 
Now, uh, so one, so what am I doing on the time? It should uh, conclude soon, I think. Yeah. Uh, so now the irrelevant direction can be identified with uh, principal component analysis, which is just a covariance matrix. And uh, surprisingly, you can compress uh, the digit into the 10 largest uh, <laughs> uh, component of the, this covariance matrix. And this is 10, 20, 30. And so you see that all the information is a much smaller uh, subspace. And so uh, you would think that uh, renormalization group ideas should uh, be important. And uh, so I have, uh, so I can talk privately uh, about things that we have been doing, like introducing hierarchical uh, structure and using it as a pre-training. Or uh, now the uh, what I am doing is I'm using this PCA on a warm picture. So these are uh, a configuration that you use in the tensor renormalization group for the Ising model. They are periodic. And then you can block them. And uh, so you can do this with the TRG method, but you can also do it with the PCA method. And so we are trying to find a correspondence between the two approach. And uh, so hopefully you will see a preprint in a few weeks about this. And so in conclusion, the universal behavior study with the renormalization group is a common denominator for uh, various lattice practitioners. We now have a method that is controllable and uh, allows us to uh, write fixed point equation. However, we don't really understand uh, in detail the uh, truncation error. Uh, we hope that uh, so the uh, experiment will be able to measure the central charge at criticality in the optical lattice model and also hope that RGID will play an important role in the machine learning. So thank you for your attention. Well, so the the, the, the so the the uh, configuration are the real space and the PCA are the when you do so you have nonlinear nonlinear flows and you have the important direction so they are not uh, obvious in the configuration space. Yeah. So that the PCA gives you the relevant direction in in uh, abstract uh, space. Well, so th 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 the reason, the reason, uh, yeah. So if if you, so if if you do block spinning in configuration space, you will immediately get non-local interactions. With the tensor, everything stays local. So the tensor, by the connectivity <laughs> properties, is always local. So it's this is always. So you, you have an in, so now you are giving up the Hamiltonian picture. You can go from a Hamiltonian to a tensor. You, you, there is no way back, and so it's a new uh, way to approach the the problem. Uh-huh. Yeah. So that's a good yeah, that's a very good so small 
Yeah, so, uh, yep. So, Yeah. Yeah. So I think you need a problem with a transition. You need a problem. You the RG method will be applicable to a learning problem where you have transitions of a. So what are, what, uh, what are such problems? Well, so you need a tunable parameter that uh, will go from problem where you have small correlation length to problem where you have larger correlation length. Mm -hmm. I, well, can the, yeah, I, I, I can. Uh -huh. uh, I, so I, so let's take the, the, so the MNIST, the, the digits, I think the RG uh, idea will not work in their full extent because there is no fixed point in that problem. It, it's a problem that it, it, it is, you beat it to death so with. Well, so uh, the only example I was given was in cosmology. So the, co cosmology, so they have, uh, they, they have uh, uh, Bayesian, uh, model where they, so they use Gaussian statistics and then they make uh, non-Gaussian perturbation with Feynman diagram. And so they have uh, one parameter family of models where there is a transition. And so that's an example where you could uh, nail it down. The one I'm trying to do is to look at the picture from the high temperature expansion of the Ising model because this, so this is a, uh, so this is a collection of like MNIST data, if you want, but where you tune the temperature and when you get near the transition, something uh, should fail or some, something remarkable should happen. But uh, so as you say, I, I think uh, for generic problem, it, the RG method are not very important. However, uh, for instance, I've tried, I didn't have time to show, but uh, so these perceptron, so you have, uh, you have a 28 by 28 picture, so you have 784 dig uh, digit, and then I add uh, 196 hidden variable, so it, and it's, it's a big matrix, but uh, I attached the hidden variable to little square only, and I didn't lose much of the, uh, I didn't lose much of the efficiency. And it's, it's like using the RG method when you have small correlation length. And so you can use, uh, you can understand uh, the problem at a few different scale, but to have a full RG description, you need all the, the scales. And so you need to look at problem that have a transition. We hopefully is not driving a car. But, uh, <laughs> Thank you. <laughs>